In the last few years, Republicans have been increasingly concerned about a woke corporate agenda. We live, as you may have noticed, in the age of woke capital. Woke capitalism. They're so close, but they're missing the real problem. It's not that corporations and establishment politicians care too much about racial or gender justice. The problem is they pretend to care about racism or misogyny to defend their wealth and power. And that's what we should be worried about, the amount of power that corporate elites have over working people. No matter who appears on a company website or how many donations they make to charities, nothing materially changes for working people when a corporation pretends to be woke. But none of that hypocrisy is what bothers the far right. If the radical left doesn't end its obsession with identity politics, it'll tear this country apart. The right wing opposes woke capital because they see social justice as a thorn in the side of the big business that funds them. But even establishment politicians use woke language to defend their corporate backers. If we broke up the big banks tomorrow, would that end racism? Would that end sexism? Would that end discrimination against the LGBT community? So how can working people actually fight back against corporations and establishment politicians who co-opt social movement language? Can identity politics be salvaged from corporate America and their political allies? I'm Olufemi Taiwo, author of the book Elite Capture, and this is The Classroom for More Perfect Union. First off, I want to explain what I mean by identity politics, a term which is often misused. Identity politics is not about solutions. It's about but, undoing civilization, but Greg, and especially you, capitalism you, in America. Antifa's a red herring. It was originally coined by black feminists in the 70s. They'd been shut out of the black power movement and the women's liberation movement. They wanted to fully participate in both and political life more broadly. Dr. Kianga Yamada Taylor at Princeton explained, one could not expect black women to be wholly active in political movements that neither represented nor advanced their interests. Identity politics were essential as entry points for black women to engage in politics. In modern political jargon, identity politics are often referred to as an antithesis or distraction from class struggle. And they've made a decision to no longer try to have class warfare. They want racial warfare. But the Combe River Collective, who created the term identity politics, were socialists who believed recognition of people's needs based on different identities was part of cultivating more power for the working class. The whole point was that their identities and their class position was intertwined. The needs of oppressed communities aren't obstacles in the fight for worker power. They're ways to build solidarity, which begets more power. Like the 1980s lesbians and gays support minors movement, where a group of queer Britons rallied together for minor labor rights. In the 1930s through the 1960s, labor unions were some of the most powerful voices against racial segregation. As solidarity increased between working people across race, movements for workers' rights, women's rights, gay rights, and civil rights won big victories. In response, conservatives launched new efforts to destroy the solidarity of the working class. The Right to Work movement, a collection of laws helping companies destroy unions, was started by Vance Muse, a Texas businessman in the early 20th century. Muse said of unionization, from now on, white women and white men will be forced into organizations with black African apes whom they will have to call brother or lose their jobs. But today, the wealthy and powerful use the term identity politics to mean anything they consider too black or queer or feminine for their tastes. Identity politics. Tribal racial identity politics. The never ending stream of identity politics. So how did the form of politics created by black radical feminist socialists become a favorite of Pepsi and Starbucks? The answer is elite capture. In most societies, there are elites who have advantages over other people in some specific area of life, who have more land or resources or even skill at something than the people around them. But how much control over how we work, where we live, or even how we talk can elites get by some more narrow kind of advantage? That depends on how unequal things are, how big the inequality is between elites and non-elites, and how effective non-elites can be in demanding fairness across different aspects of social life. The elite few redirect resources and institutions that should serve the many towards their own interests. What was once all of ours becomes theirs. That's the norm in hierarchical society. Elites capture identity politics for largely the same reasons and in the same ways as they capture everything else, from natural resources to government subsidies to labor. 
The CEO of JP Morgan took a knee at a bank branch without addressing systemic problems of capital and loan access or investments in companies that benefit from racial inequality. Washington, D.C. opened Black Lives Matter Plaza while the district's police were shooting black residents, harassing protesters, and violently enforcing the racial status quo. And every Pride Month, major corporations and even the military post messages claiming to care about the LGBTQ plus community. Corporations captured identity politics because they saw how valuable it is. They understand it changed how people felt about themselves and each other, so they found a way to make it work for them. Imagine our society is a house. It's got a number of rooms in it, but some of those rooms are only accessible to certain people based on their race or class or other factors. There are plenty of rooms of power like this in our real society. I'm sitting in this room across from you because of my background, my race, my class, my family history. And you're sitting there watching this video because of yours. This may not be the nicest room in the world, but it's nicer than some others. At the top of the house is the nicest room. Resources from the rest of the rooms flow there because of how the house is built. There, elite members of the house make decisions on how the house is run. The elites in this room might feel pressure from the people in other rooms to at least acknowledge that the way things are being run is unfair and unequal. The elites don't want to lose wealth and power, but they want to appear like they're recognizing the humanity of the people in the other rooms. To stay on top without giving up anything, they take the language of identity politics. They recognize other people in the room who represent marginalized demographics. They don't change the structure of the house. They just change who appears in the nicest rooms. They might even pass the mic to those people. They might choose to take up less space or center the most marginalized. It's easy for the elite. Just make it seem like they are elevating new voices or creating space for people who were previously denied it. I call that deference politics because it's based on asking us to defer to others in the room who come from more marginalized identities and to believe the act of listening to the people who represent those communities in the room is the solution. Lifting up marginalized voices and making space for others can be a useful step, but deferring to more marginalized voices within the room of power on its own does nothing for all those other people in the house who will never access wealth or power. And sometimes, claiming to care about marginalized voices can be a way to maintain wealth and power for the elite. Listen to this clip from an internal REI podcast. Hi, REI. My name is Walter Wallace, and I serve as your Chief Diversity and Social Impact Officer. I use she, her pronouns, and am speaking to you today from the traditional lands of the Ohlone people. The same podcast then goes on to implore employees not to unionize. One of the top questions that must be on people's minds is why REI doesn't think unionization is the right thing for the co-op or for the employees. They use progressive language to union bust. Starbucks made a PR push for their program expanding healthcare benefits for trans employees in 2018 then threatened to take those benefits away during the current union push. Amazon even used charities meant to support black business owners to argue against antitrust laws which would support small businesses. If we really want to change how life works for working people and others towards the bottom of the social structure, we can't just focus on matters of representation who is speaking. We need new rooms and a new blueprint for the house that they're in. Yes, it is valuable for individuals to learn how to understand their privilege, and to organize with others who share our identities. But forms of deference politics that ask identity privileged people to take up less space and feel bad about themselves will never threaten the global financial and political elite who control our society. Instead of identity politics, which can be easily co-opted by corporate America, we need to work together for constructive politics, focusing on positive outcomes for working people. To get there, we can start with identity, but however we start, we have to arrive at solidarity. We need to recognize the way we are different, yes, but to actually challenge the elites who dominate wealth and power in our society, the working class also needs to connect through our similarities. That's solidarity. Solidarity recognizes our mutual interests and shared humanities and identifies our shared adversaries. It's about accepting that our fates are intertwined instead of allowing those in power to exploit our differences to divide us. Solidarity is a key principle for successful labor union organizing. You know, it takes a whole freaking village 
to win. You know, one voice is not going to count. We want to represent all people. We want to make sure that um, it's all inclusive and putting workers in the driver's seat, that's the ultimate power. It's quite illogical to actually say, well, I'm gay and I'm into defending the gay community, but I don't care about anything else. It's ludicrous. It's important that if you're defending communities, that you also defend all communities and not just one. Solidarity unites working people against the corporate elite and isn't satisfied with symbolic victories or the mere appearance of justice. Solidarity fights until a more equitable distribution of wealth and power has been won. But we can't achieve true solidarity until we identify and acknowledge what is really dividing us. Far-right media, establishment politicians, and big corporations united in the cause of capturing more power and wealth for the elite. As Dorian Warren says, the goal is not a rainbow oligarchy, but a truly equitable multiracial democracy. Once we collectively realize who is trying to divide us, we can work towards solidarity and real economic justice for everyone, not just the symbolic identity politics facade created by the ultra-wealthy.